The information and opinions expressed in this video are of a general nature and are not intended to be investment advice, research, or recommendations. Please consult your investment professional for your own circumstances. The information in this video reflects the opinions of ARCA Labs and the video's participants on the date of production and are subject to change at any time without notice due to various factors. ARCA Labs is separate and unaffiliated from any third parties participating in the video presentation, and ARCA Labs is not responsible for any third parties' products, services, or policies. Our Wealthy Tokenization Talks, powered by ARCA Labs. ARCA Labs is focused on innovating responsibly. Uh, responsibly. I'm Annalise Osborne. Uh, we are excited to bring you an institutional thought leaders in the digital asset space. So our guest today is Sandy Cowell of Franklin Templeton, who is a visionary uh, for the future of investments in wealth management industry. Sandy, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to see you. Pleasure to be here, Annalise. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. So before we dive into today's conversation, I do want to highlight that Franklin Templeton, you guys had your first uh, tokenized money market fund. So it's exciting to see innovations in the regulated world. So I think that I wanted to throw that out there, not the topic of today's conversation. Sandy's got some great ideas on the future of really wealth management. So Sandy, do you want to go ahead and talk about alternatives? Sure. As of my last minute plug to add to that, we just announced last week that we launched a whole set of separately managed account portfolios with multi-coin portfolios. So that's also super exciting and we're expanding our whole product set from Franklin Templeton. I did want to start out at least in thinking about how to position what the innovation that we're seeing in the digital space in terms of when you think about a broader portfolio of investment holdings. And you know, for many years, really since the early 2000s, we've thought a lot about the role of alternatives in the portfolio. Um, and we have increasingly expanded what we saw as that set of, port of alternatives. We started with hedge funds, then we started moving more and more into the private assets, so private equity, real assets. Um, then we started to see uh, the displacement of the banks getting out of many of the lending markets, this whole emergence of the private credit markets. And now I think you can really look at what's happening in the digital asset to, uh, domain as the emergence of what I like to call these frontier risk assets. So these frontier alternatives where yes. you're getting into assets that are very different than anything we've had in the portfolio before. So can I ask you a question? When we're talking about investments, are you talking about my personal investments or you're talking about a big asset manager of BlackRock's investments? So I'm talking about a institution's investments or an individual's investments and the types of products that someone like an, a Franklin Templeton would invest into, right, on behalf of their clients. So this would be the portfolio that I, as an asset manager, are putting together for you as my client, whether you're an institution or an individual. So I think when you think of what's happening as this idea of there being these new set of frontier assets, um, I think what's interesting about it is that it's unfolding in a domain, Annalise, where there is really a peer-to-peer -peer driven economy, right, which we've never had before, right? We've had some peer-to-peer -peer loans or some peer-to-peer -peer crowdfunding, but we've never had an actual peer-to-peer -peer economy. And I think that when you combine those two concepts, this idea of there being frontier risk assets with a peer-to-peer -peer economy, what you come up with is this idea that we may see a very different set of investments emerge that represent very different opportunities at a much lower scale, right? Because if you have individuals looking to put frontier alternatives into their portfolios, they're going to look at things that are both accessible to them, that they understand, and that they can afford. And that kind of dictates and pushes us towards a whole new set of alternatives that could be emerging in the next few years in this digital asset domain that could really, I think, catch a lot of people by surprise because I don't think that big institutional investors have really considered that people may think of alternative investments as a separate and apart from the types of uh, assets that they've been deploying capital to. And that's mostly because they have they have to deploy such big ticket sizes, right? If I need to deploy 50 or $100 million to an opportunity to see any kind of meaningful return in my portfolio, that really limits the number of types of investments I can make. 
But if I want to deploy a few hundred or a few thousand dollars into an investment, I'm going to be able to have a much broader set of assets that I can consider to put into my portfolio. And the things that are going to attract me to those assets are going to be things that I as an individual can really relate to. And we're calling this this idea of there being this new set of crowd factors that are beginning to emerge in the digital domain. And those crowd factors are things like prestige, influence, access, exclusivity, reward. These are all things that individuals are likely to be willing to pay for because it makes them feel good about their portfolio and have more of a personal connection to their portfolio. So does that change as opposed to investment yield? So if I invest in something, I would like a higher yield. But you're saying not necessarily, not, everyone has different, I guess, strategies for their investment. So maybe some, like, my sister wants to invest in something because she has access to a certain club or whatever it is. That's what it sounds like that you're saying. So it almost, we can, we can change the return profile uh, by giving them that, that usability factor. Yeah, I think that, think of it as twofold though, because there is that, I, I would say we're going to a multi-return model, right? Because there is that investment return. I mean, the hope is, is that the asset you purchase appreciates in value, just like any asset would. There is the enjoyment aspect, right? That if she has access to an exclusive club, uh, but there's also access in a different facet in that these new assets have smart contracts embedded within them. So you can have access to things that matter to you and that you enjoy that actually kick off income streams. So think about one of the ones I like to talk about a lot is, is buying into your favorite artist's royalty pool, right? If you love Beyonce, she just came out with this new album she may tokenize a share of the royalty pool that she's getting for the songs off that album. And you can buy into her token pool and own part of that royalty income stream. And that's income for you, in addition to enjoyment and special access, and in addition to the hope that that asset itself will appreciate over time. So you're starting to have a much more multi-dimensional model for figuring out how an asset sits in a portfolio. So I, mean, I love the idea of if I see a product I like, I could invest in that product, even if it's not public. Obviously, we have public stocks, but in the private market, it sounds like something like that. So there are smaller sizes we're talking about. And so how does that work from an institutional perspective? How does Franklin Templeton buy the royalty or do they buy all the royalty streams and then they can divvy up amongst their clients? Like how, how do you see it going from the institutional check size to the individual check size? Yeah, so there's a few different ways it can happen, right? There can be pooled investments where you're looking at an asset manager like Franklin Templeton putting together a portfolio of, you can see them having, you know, a music portfolio where you get exposure to different artists and income streams and you can pick which of the portfolio of artists that Franklin has access to that you'd like to be in your portfolio. Um, there could be tokenized investments where you're actually buying a specific asset that Franklin Templeton may have uh, uniquely sourced and owns the unique access to. So think about um, my nephew works for a big distillery here in the U.S. And he was saying that they're making this very special type of whiskey where they're only putting out 25 bottles a year. And each bottle is selling at $350,000 per piece. Um, someone like an asset manager like Franklin Templeton could buy up that entire supply uh, of that special bottle whiskey and make that a asset that is available uh, to investors in their portfolios as a unique return stream where you actually get the physical product, but you also get the investment right to just hold that product as part of a portfolio. So there's different ways that I think it could work, but I think that it's this idea that the number of alternatives is going to become very explosive. It's really going to become an exercise in creativity. And I think you're going to see increasingly asset managers competing on how well they can lock up high demand and interesting assets and put them into portfolios for their investors in very targeted and unique ways. I go back to the idea of real estate. Properties are tokenized. You could actually, if you like, uh, 
multifamily in Denver, you could invest in multifamily in Denver. Or if you want to invest, you know, if you like hotels in South Beach, you could invest in hotels in South Beach. And you could have a very specific portfolio if you can identify to certain assets geographically. I was trying to tie it into Beyonce's song, but it's difficult because it's not geographic oriented. But there are like you could you could create a portfolio geographically of, of different assets, whatever that is. Yeah, so and you could really you could localize that, which is another yeah. of the big trends I think is really going to happen in the next few years. Uh, because I live in New York City, right? I need to commute. I need to get around. I need to get to the airports. I need to get to. Um, you know, different parts of town at different times of day, you know, there might be ways that I, there may be things I'd like to invest in where maybe there's special owner's lanes to get on the highway, or maybe there is an express service where you can buy into taking a helicopter to JFK at a very low rate because you're part of an investment pool that's constantly having those helicopters on call, right? Those are things that could add both convenience to my life and the value of that access token that gives me access to that helicopter or to that owner's lane. That's going to be an asset itself that can appreciate in value over time, right? So I think that you're going to get a lot of, you know, very tactical ideas on what matters in people's lives and how do they invest in it. And that's going to become this whole new class of alternatives because they're going to be things that I may want to only spend a few hundred dollars on each year um, and renew that or look at different opportunities. So I, I think that the time horizon and the utilization horizons are going to really shift for alternatives away from this idea that an alternative is a very long-term asset. So can you talk to me about how you see this, like a, um, a roadmap of how you see us progressing towards this investment strategy? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you're already starting to see in the NFT space, right, the non-fungible token space, where a lot of institutions are still very dismissive about the potential of NFTs. Uh, but you're seeing a, a growing market and a growing sophistication of the offerings that are being done in this NFT space, particularly from a lot of corporate players. And this is what I think a lot of people are missing about the NFT space is that the corporations seem to be catching on much faster than the institutions in terms of the potential of these NFTs. And so you're seeing this interesting, they're calling it digital, this combination of the physical and the digital worlds coming together in a way that they're using these these nft tokens and these nft products to get users in the door of the corporation and toward their products in a very pointed way a, a great example is estee lauder um, launched a new makeup line where you would actually upload your picture and they would put the makeup on you on your picture and you could see how the makeup would look on you and then you could decide whether you liked how that looked and you could actually order it from your virtual makeup mirror and they would ship it to you directly. So they're combining this with the physical and then, you know, that's a product example, but then you could see them really taking that year's special colors and tokenizing the special lipstick colors that year. Uh, and you could buy into the demand for that year's colors. And that could be a return stream that someone could put into their portfolio. And you might only pay $50 to get a lipstick token for that year's colors. But maybe by the end of the season, that $50 might be worth $150. And even though that's not a return stream that would matter in an institutional sized portfolio, that's a nice return for an individual investor. So I think that's what I mean by these assets becoming very creative and very uh, affordable to the everyday person. Sure, and they, they, from a yield perspective, that's a little difficult to calculate or project, but <laughs> the, the doubling of value, but I, but I see what your point is. So one of the issues I think in digital assets right now is the distribution. And so I saw that you guys um, now have SMAs, that you, which is exciting. Congratulations, kind Thank of a you. step towards that. So how do you think we build out the distribution to the end consumer, to kind of your clients, right? How, how does that shift? How do, how do we find the people that are interested in investing in digital assets in an institutional nature? I think you're going to see wealth advisors become increasingly interested in using the collaboration that's required around identifying and, and 
really putting investments into their investors' portfolios um, as a new way of them really deepening their relationships, right? So, you know, not only do I want to give a generic exposure potentially to a multi-coin portfolio, you know, I might find out from that individual, you know, what else might they want from that portfolio. And I might go out and look for assets that have these crowd factors associated with them. So, I might want to have an NFT portfolio for my individual investor uh, that the wealth manager puts together that they profile the investor's interests and then they go out and they find NFTs that are going to match things that they are interested in. So it creates a, a point of interest between the advisor and their client and it creates a point of stickiness because now you're offering a new type of advisory which is asset selection but asset selection that appeals to a person's uh, enjoyment of their own life and their relationship with their own investments, right? An investment that is giving me something beyond just an investment return that matters to me is an investment that I'm going to actually be more excited about. And the person who helps me find it, I'm going to feel more goodwill toward because that is now something that has meaning to me beyond just whether it's going to accumulate in value. No, I, I understand, especially with the ESG movement. I think mm -hmm. people are looking for more sustainable investments. Maybe this is another step to do that both from the institutional level and from the retail level. Yeah, and yeah. People, people want to do good in their life and they want to see things that matter to them happen in their life from a values perspective. But sometimes people just want to enjoy life, right? And things that can go into their portfolio can be things that actually help them enjoy their life more, um, but that also have the potential to appreciate and value and has the potential to give them return. And that's really what I think this new digital asset world and tokenization is going to open up for people. That's exciting. I look, for, I look forward to uh, helping build that as a, a, and watching you help her build it. So, Me too. <laughs> uh, thank you, Sandy, so much. This is great. I know these are important sweet talks, but um, you give me a lot to think about as a takeaway. And um, I look forward to working together with you in the future and hopefully helping develop some of this. So, Excellent, Annalise, and I can't wait to hear the rest of the series. Yes, thanks so much. Thanks, Danny. Take care. Bye-bye.